Welcome to Ed Talks. My name is Dr. David Slump. I am a Board of Governors Teaching Chair here at the University of Lethbridge and I'd like to welcome Dr. Robin Derry from the Faculty of Management uh, who teaches business ethics uh, for the University of Lethbridge at our Calgary campus. So welcome Robin. Thank you. So the Ed Talk series is about uh, exploring people's experiences and expertise in teaching, excellence in teaching, and, and thought it might be nice to begin by just kind of talking about your journey to teaching business ethics um, for the University of Lethbridge. What, what brought you to where you are now? I moved up here from uh, the U.S. about 10 years ago. So I most recently, I, I am teaching in the Calgary campus, but I taught on the Edmonton campus for nine years before that. So the Edmonton campus of the University of Lethbridge is where I came for the, my first connection to the University of Lethbridge. But before that, I had, gosh, about uh, 20 years in academics uh, teaching business ethics at a number of different institutions and, and doing research um, since my graduate work in the 80s. But before that, uh, really, the answer to what brought me to business ethics was uh, several years of experience in the restaurant business. So I had majored in French as an undergraduate and uh, then ended up through some phone calls and some con meetings and some connections um, following the recommendation of Julia Child, a, a famous American chef, uh, home teaching, not a, not a restaurant chef, but you know, her kitchen's now in the Smithsonian. Yeah. Um, and uh, really one of the first uh, sort of professional chefs to bring French cooking to American homes uh, and, and really the first chef on television in the US. So um, she was in the Boston area. I had always sort of loved and respected her, her writings and her work and so 1970-something, six, I guess, uh, I called her on the phone and said, because there were phone books and you could find people yeah, in the phone books at wow. that point, uh, I said, I'm interested in learning more about cooking and maybe teaching cooking sometime. And, uh, you know, and I had some things prepared and I just talked for about two minutes until she cut me off and invited me over for lunch. Because wow. it turns out when you're somebody who writes cookbooks, you have to invite people over a lot because you're trying to cook a lot of food and you have wow. to feed people and all that. Anyway, so she pretty quickly said, um, you know, you know French and you should get over to Paris and study cooking. And as she said, Jim Beard, referring to James Beard, another famous American chef, um, and I are backing this school in Paris, La Varenne, and uh, they need apprentices to help sort of be the sous chefs and in these teaching classes. So uh, I'll write them and tell them that you're going to come. When can you go? <laughs> and I said, well, uh, July 1st. It just really, you know, there's no internet at that point. It's all yeah. sort of letters through the mail. And so I guess that means, you know, you'll write them and I'll get a ticket and I'll go to Paris and I'll hope that they're waiting for wow. me. Um, so anyway, I, I, I did that. That was pretty exciting and fun and, and <laughs> educational in many ways. Yeah. Uh, it was, I learned a kind of French that I hadn't learned at Dartmouth College and, yeah. um, uh, and learned a lot about cooking. And it was, I know this is a long route to business ethics, yeah. but it, it was a kind of experience that you kind of just imagine or dream of. I, you know, I was going from the airport to my uh, dorm where I was staying and the taxi driver asked me what I was doing and I said studying cooking and he goes off on a history of French cooking. You know, <laughs> it's just so integral to who the French people are. It was really exciting. And then I came back and I worked in Washington DC and Princeton, New Jersey and New York City in a number of different restaurants. Yeah. and. <clears throat> Um, and that was interesting, but disenchanting, disillusioning, so much badly prepared food and so many terribly run workplaces. I, I began asking all these questions, which eventually somebody pointed out to me, were not really questions about the restaurant business as much as they were ethical questions mm -hmm. about 
what kind of food and were they disclosing the ingredients and why were the employees being treated this way and whose values were these anyway that were shaping this kind of work environment where the health code inspectors got bribed and uh, that was New York City and uh, so uh, you know there were lots of things that I encountered about management and about work organizations and about the quality of life and and the quality of service eventually some of those things in New York City restaurants drove me crazy enough that I I quit once again while well, I had a series of quits along the way, but um, and each time I would quit and I'd say, I'm, that's it, I'm just not doing, you know, I'm not cooking professionally anymore, I can't stand this, this restaurant business is terrible, uh, but then something would come along and somebody would say, oh, I know this place, you should get it, you know, you should work over there, or I'd get my hopes up again. Anyway, I eventually, on the advice of somebody who said, look, if you, you, know, if you can't stand the heat, you should get out of the kitchen. This yeah, is yeah, New yeah. York City, and it is the restaurant business, and it's kind of the way it works. Um, I left, and I went up to New Hampshire that felt like home and was hired by Dartmouth College, my alma mater, to start a cafe on campus that I could determine the menu. I could hire, hopefully, students. I could teach them how to cook. I could order the equipment. That was kind of the cool part. Well, I mean, it was all cool, but that was pretty wonderful to could order whisks that were really huge <laughs> and, and, you know, it's great kitchen equipment. Yeah. And I did. I taught a lot of people how to cook and we all learned how to make omelets together. We came, became an omelet restaurant and, you know, we didn't serve meat. We didn't serve fast food. We didn't yeah. serve burgers and fries. It was just really good, healthy food. And I was able to sort of make good on my criticisms of many of the places after doing that and working for a few, you know, well, about a year of 90-hour weeks, mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I, I need, I, I'm back to needing some intellectual challenge again. And I, and I began to think about that comment to me of all your questions are about ethics and why don't you go study business ethics? And, and, and I thought, oh yeah, that's great. That's what I'll do. But it was the early 80s and it was hard to find a place to study business ethics mm -hmm. at that point because they weren't really teaching ethics in business schools. It was very marginal. But I, I kind of kicking and screaming, I got through an MBA program. I, I didn't like it very much because I didn't really think they were asking the right questions. Right. I wanted to ask other questions, not how should we price this, but should this product even be on the market? And mm -hmm. not so many people wanted to ask those questions, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the very end, uh, of my MBA program, I had a chance to teach as a teaching assistant with another, with a professor. And as those first few days that I was dis teaching, I discovered that I had a lot of the same satisfaction that I had in the restaurant business. Right, yeah. I just didn't yeah. have to stand on my feet all day yeah. long yeah. and uh, sweat over a hot stove in order to have this satisfaction of kind of feeding people. Yeah. Yeah. And Along the way, I thought, oh, I don't actually really like the restaurant business. I just like feeding people. I like, I like doing it for love and not yeah. for money. I don't, yeah. I don't really care about the money part. And, and, and that sort of transferred into teaching um, that I, I brought to teaching that sort of love of nurturing and feeding and sharing and saying, here, I think this would be good for you. Uh, I think this is a way you can learn. So, you know, within that sort of journey and that circle, I came back to discovering that teaching was really a, a, a huge passion and, and fun. I think I had avoided teaching for a while because my mother was a high school teacher. And so I kind of felt like, well, that's taken. Yeah. You have to do something else. So teaching hadn't really occurred to me. I didn't realize it would be nearly as exciting yeah. as it was for me. And so then I thought, oh, well, that's that's what I want to be doing. So yeah. to do that, oh, and to study business ethics, I need a PhD. And so I went to the administration of my then university, University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and said, look, I, I know I didn't take some of these courses that seriously because I didn't really like them, but I'll do better, <laughs> I promise, because I like this. Now I can study business ethics, okay? So I'll, I'll do better. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, let me do a PhD, and I'll, I promise I'll do better. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, they let me stay and yeah. work on a PhD that way. So, wow. so then I began to sort of say, okay, what are the ethical questions that I really care about? Yeah. Wow. So, so some long story, but and yeah. some purposeful direction. It looks checkered, but really, yeah. you know, there's some following. Yeah. You talked about sort of discovering this 
passion for teaching and, and, and this idea of, about feeding people. Um, obviously, it's a different kind of feeding people. But what have you learned about sort of teaching and feeding people and how do those <laughs> fit together? And what do they look like? And what does it look like to approach teaching from that perspective? Well, and then you put ethics in there right, too. Yeah. It's, you know, as I think when somebody's an ethicist or cares about ethical issues, and I can see this when I go to conferences, um, it's very easy to be morally self-righteous. Right, yeah. And uh, so sometimes people say, oh, you're a chef. And I say, yeah, I'm also an ethicist. So we eat a lot of bean soup and whole wheat bread, you know, because there are some, well, they're right things. There's right, right and right. wrong and right yeah. and wrong sort of sneaks into everything. And then it's hard. And you want to say, you know, people come over, your son says, hey, chocolate chip cookies. And you have to struggle with that a little bit. Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of butter in there, you know. <laughs> It's not really fun, yeah. either in teaching or in feeding people, right. if you start making moral judgments about yeah. kind of everything being right and wrong. Yeah. So there's that, you know, sort of teaching people who gets to decide what they need, how they learn, how they consume. There are some of those kinds of things that I've learned as my children have fledged and, you know, teenagehood and, and yeah. moving on into adulthood. At some point, you have to let them decide what, what mm -hmm. they want to learn and what they want to eat and what they want to consume and how, yeah. who they want to grow into. Yeah. There are times when I'm teaching uh, when I might struggle with a textbook a little bit or I might struggle with how a student is approaching a class mm -hmm. or how they're writing papers. And I, you know, I want to say, here's the best way of doing it. Yeah. And, you know, you can say that, but then you've got to let go and sort of say, okay, I get it. Some people yeah. are pretty happy getting Bs, or some people are pretty happy getting Cs, or some people just want to get the surface of this, and other people really want to go into it and, and look deep, deeply. And I, it's my job to teach all of them, yeah. uh, so, and not be making yeah. big moral judgments. Yeah. But I think also that because I am somebody who takes ethics seriously, uh, and because I've faced some challenges in my professional life, both in the restaurant business, but then in academics as well, um, through my various jobs and institutions. Mm -hmm. There are times when I have faced really difficult questions. Right. And there was a time back 15 more years ago um, when I ended up in a grievance situation because of some student concerns about sexual harassment and I felt obliged to bring concerns forward. And you know, you're teaching business ethics and you think, oh, do I, do I have to actually do this? Yeah, yeah. Or can I just teach it? Yeah. Maybe I could just talk about yeah. ethics <laughs> and not have to actually live it out. Well, yeah. no, it doesn't work that way. You actually yeah. have to sort of stand up for things that you say yeah. you believe in and, yeah. uh, and sometimes go through fights about them. And, I'm pretty candid about those things when I'm teaching because I want students to know that I understand uh, that it's not really easy to, to always be practicing the highest ethical standards. Yeah. It's important and it's important, really important that we think about it and talk about it, but it's important to look at the costs and the consequences yeah. as well. And so I try to be really candid about what some of those experiences have been. And then students ask me a lot of questions about mm. how did your family deal with that? Or yeah. um, what, if, what if you don't have that kind of support? Or what if you don't win? Or what if, what if you have to move jobs? And sometimes I think my being candid about some of those difficult challenges in my professional life um, has kind of enabled students to feel like then they can ask me questions about their own work life. Yeah. Um, sometimes teaching ethics is like opening a door because you, people start to think about ethical issues and then yeah, they yeah, see yeah. them in many places. Yeah. And then you get questions about their religion or their family or their lives yeah. or there's other classes. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a lot. But I think my interest is really whether I'm teaching policy and strategy, which I often do, or a business ethics class specifically, or environmental management, um, I, I'm always trying to encourage students to ask hard questions, right. uncomfortable questions, difficult questions yeah. that maybe aren't in the textbook, sort of being willing to look at, well, what's, 
what happens if that part's not true? Or what yeah. if not everybody shares the same yeah. values that you do? And how do you, how do you yeah. solve that in the workplace? There are two questions that come up from what you're, yeah. me what you're saying. Um, the first one, it strikes me in the work that I do with, with teachers um, that one of the greatest challenges teachers face is giving up that, that control, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's easy to be the, you know, the sage on the stage who's got the lesson all planned out and the lecture all lined up and everything's done. And you know from the moment you step in and the moment you end what it's going to be in that. Or when you plan a course, have everything laid out. But it sounds to me that that's something you've learned to sort of give up a little bit is that being always in control, knowing always where it goes, that part of this, mm. this notion of feeding mm. people is saying, what do people need? How do I respond to them? How, how do you, how do you, how do you work in that kind of a space? Um, I think unlike uh, many other professors, I do not feel an enormous need for control. So I right. don't usually go into a class with a full plan knowing how it's going to yeah. unfold and what I'm going to say at each stage and, and where I'm going to bring in prompts. Or um, My family teases me a little yeah. bit about this. I'm a very calm person. Yeah. And so I get a little bit of adrenaline in the last 10 minutes before a class starts yeah, yeah. if I'm not completely planned out. Yeah, and yeah. then I really use that <laughs> adrenaline. And it used to be when you didn't have to get to airports completely yeah. hours ahead of time, you know, I could sneak in the last 15 minutes and yeah, people yeah. would say, a little bit of rush for you, Robin, <laughs> you know, kind of like, wow, you must get this. You have to look hard to get mm -hmm. your little, you know, adrenaline rushes. Yeah. But, but I feel a little apologetic about it. It's yeah. hard to advocate that people not plan. Yeah. But for me, I get my best ideas walking to class. Yeah, and yeah. so I've come to sort of count on that. Yeah. If somebody comes up and asks me a question on my way to class, I'm a little gruff because, yeah. excuse me, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I really love learning from what students say. Yeah. And so I'm not, I'm not at all convinced that I'm, I'm the source of, of everything that's going to yeah. be the educational part of the class. Yeah. And I'm going to jump to yeah. that's part of what's really fun about teaching on the Calgary campus right. is we have such a diverse group of students right. from so many countries. Uh, and I have no assumptions that I understand what their, all their needs are yeah. or their interests or their educational background yeah. or their knowledge. And some have worked in government in Nigeria or, or in businesses in Angola or have grown up in refugee camps in Sudan and what they bring to class is just mm -hmm. remarkable to me. Mm -hmm. And so I am always on the lookout for people to bring those experiences in and to talk yeah. about um, their own interests and needs. And I, I, don't, I don't feel a great need to say, oh, but we had to cover this material. I'm yeah. just really excited to sort of see what, what people bring. Yeah. I find in my own teaching, it's, there's this pressure to have that well laid out lesson. I used to plan with my PowerPoints and have, you know, the whole thing sequenced out. And, and then I stopped and I kind of looked back on a few years of teaching and realized that some of my best classes were the ones where I, where I wrote five points or ten points hmm. down on a little sheet of paper and I knew the kind of activities I wanted to do and then you walk in mm -hmm. and, and you go and then you respond so much more to yeah. you're in a space where you can respond more to the people in the room and yeah. what they're bringing and what their needs are then than if you're really following that scripted mm -hmm. uh, that scripted last I think some of the risk and then the, some of the pressure and the risk is that um, that can slide into a reliance on a few students yeah. who are quite talkative. Yeah. And then that begins to really shift the dynamic of the class. So I feel like I have to be careful of that because mm -hmm. um, usually there are a few students who are happy to, to speak up and, yeah. and others who are pretty quiet. And again, with very different um, educational backgrounds yeah. coming in, I find many students come from uh, educational systems where they're really much more passive than I'm expecting or hoping for. And so they're not at all sure that it's right to be mm -hmm. speaking up. And so then there's a little bit of imbalance of mm -hmm. who, who's controlling the yeah, class. Absolutely. 
when you kind of take this approach and you're, you're opening up ethical questions and then students begin responding with their own ethical questions and their mm -hmm. own scenarios and that, mm -hmm. how, how, do you, how do you navigate that kind of space? Because I'm sure it, it puts you in delicate situations from time to time as well where you have to wonder what's the best way to respond here or, or do I go down this road with this student on this question mm -hmm. or, or how, how do you... How do you deal with well, that? Well, I think if I felt, I, I, I can't really um, think of struggling with that too much in class. I think I, I wouldn't hesitate to say we could, you know, if it sounds like a live issue and something that they're not hauling out mm -hmm. of, oh, when I was a teenager, but, you know, I don't hesitate to say we could talk more about this or mm -hmm. I'd be more than happy to have coffee or go for a walk or just, you know, talk a little more about it or I might say that afterwards to somebody if it felt like it was a you know something they were really struggling with uh, and sometimes people ask leading questions of me which kind of give a little bit of clue to something they might be struggling with mm -hmm. in their own life um, but in class I think um, I when I'm teaching something like ethics I'm I've taught it enough years that I'm pretty good at using examples that people might bring to demonstrate certain kinds of ethical reasoning mm -hmm. or certain different approaches. So um, I remember this year somebody <clears throat> kind of one, of one of the guys in my class talked about being with a friend in high school and that friend taking his father's car without permission, they go off on some adventure, they get into an accident and, you know, sort of the worst, what, you know, yeah, of yeah, a borrowed yeah, car. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, so then my student had to make a decision. He needed to get his friend to the hospital. He also needed the father to be knowledgeable and supportive. So, you know, so he was saying, so, uh, you know, the father came and said, who was driving? And I said, I was, even though I wasn't, yeah, it was yeah. really, you know. And so he was sort of saying, I lied, but I did it because I needed to protect my friend and get yeah. his father actively involved. And it was, a, it was a perfect story for me because I was trying to uh, explain. And it was a situation, obviously, everybody could identify yeah, with, yeah, even yeah. if they hadn't actually stolen their parents' car <laughs> at some point, you can all sort of imagine or be close enough to, mm -hmm. to that situation as a teenager. Um, but to talk about the question of ethical decision-making using outcomes, sort of this consequentialist utilitarian reasoning versus um, rules, more of a Kantian approach, and that is a great example of uh, and so I kept coming back mm. to it. I kept sort of telling it again, and I kept sort of putting him a little bit on the spot, which was okay because <laughs> he's in his 30s. It was yeah. a long time ago, but and I, I knew that, and everybody was sort of laughing at him by then. But it was, you know, it was it was useful to say, okay, if you had made this kind of decision, where would that have gotten you, and yeah. would you have achieved what you needed to? But that doesn't mean we can completely overlook the rules and just look at the consequences. Right. So, yeah. I think of ethics as very much a kind of toolbox. I mean, I think of ethical theory that way. Mm -hmm. I'm not a, not a pure philosopher by any means. Mm -hmm. And so I, I look at uh, the various approaches to ethical reasoning in a kind of a pragmatic way. So I'm, I'm eager to make use of students' uh, experiences to help them think about how yeah. you might use these tools. Yeah. What are the sort of the core, I don't know, values, understandings, habits of mind that you, that you try to cultivate in your students when it comes to ethical thinking in business? I think that I am encouraging them most of all to ask questions about how do I figure out what the right thing to do is. And I know that many, many professors think of themselves as encouraging critical thinking and encouraging people to ask questions, but um, those of us that teach ethics, many people do it, we, we have different perspectives. I was thinking about this on the way over here, that some people are really comfortable with one theory and they really like to promote right. themselves as an Aristotelian or a Kantian or utilitarian, 
Uh, and as I said, my approach is much more of a, these are tools. Yeah. And it's good to know the different tools. And mm -hmm. it's good to be able to use all of them. Mm -hmm. And to understand what some tools are good for and what they're not good mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and see their limitations. So um, I'm trying to encourage people to understand those basic tools and know mm -hmm. how to use them. But to use them, you know, it's not just like picking them up. It's being willing to keep asking questions about what else should I take into consideration? Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen then? And for me, that's just being willing to keep asking questions, keep looking really carefully, sort of engage in ethical reflection. Mm -hmm. I've learned this through research, trying to study how people engage in moral reasoning. I've discovered that a fair number of people really don't like sorting through those ethical right, dilemmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they just will say, oh, yeah. I don't have any ethical dilemmas in the workplace. <laughs> like, they just didn't occur to me. If you push them, they might say, well, they're messy. I yeah. don't want to, you know, I, I don't impose my judgment on other people, yeah. or I don't, you know, I just yeah. follow the rules or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but to me, some of that is, I would just as soon not. It's like somebody right. saying, I would just as soon not have to struggle with that question very much. I'd like to say something uh, that's a cliche or flippant mm -hmm. or just, mm -hmm. oh, everybody does it, or if I don't, somebody else will, or one of these things that we just say to kind of excuse right. whatever we feel like doing. And uh, I'm always hoping that people will pause and ask questions and say, well, uh, I don't know, is that really the right thing? And mm -hmm. Who's it going to affect? And how am I going to feel about it afterwards? Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of example does it set for my kids or for mm -hmm. kids I might have sometime or if I'm, you know, my friends or whatever? And, and how will I feel? So uh, I'm just hoping that people will get familiar with the tools enough and see the value in asking mm -hmm. those kinds of questions. Yeah. We use tools. We, we use them to build or we use them to put something together. Or we, what do you hope your students, when they use those tools, what, are they, what do you hope they're building toward? Fundamentally, it's, I think it's a better world when we uh, ask those kinds of questions. I think mm -hmm. when we don't ask ethical questions, we um, are not carefully thinking about all of the implications mm -hmm. of our actions. We're not thinking about how we become better people and how we create better worlds and how we create better organizations. And so, you know, sometimes people I know have an attitude about ethics in business as if it's an oxymoron, you know, that sort of, I've heard many, many jokes about people always think they're the first ones who think, oh, it's contradiction in terms. <laughs> uh, or it's a very short book you're, you know, you're <laughs> using or something like that. Um, and, you know, so I know jumbo shrimp, yeah. military intelligence, civil engineering, you know, yeah. all those sort of things that yeah. some people like to call oxymorons and some people get terribly offended at. Yeah. I think that really fundamentally uh, I'm in it because I think, oh, I know what I was going to say. Mm. Sorry, I'm going to jump back. Sometimes people say in the midst of that oxymoron discussion, um, oh, be real. That's not the way the world works. Yeah, this yeah. is reality, especially around business. You know, yeah. be tough. You have to make the buck, or you have to meet uh, the bottom line. Is is always the the profit, and yeah. uh, it's all about the money. And, and sometimes students say these things to me, or other people, when I'm saying I'm doing research or work in teaching and in, in ethics. My feeling, and sometimes I get this into words, and sometimes I just manage to walk away. But uh, is well we get to create the realities yeah. that we're right. working in. And if that's the reality you choose to operate in, then that's the reality you're going to carry out. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we get to create the, the realities of these worlds, these environments that yeah. we're working in. How we treat other people, how we do business is going to affect that reality. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can have your reality, but I'm going to create mine. Yeah. And so I'm I'm an advocate of students sort of taking charge and building the reality that is their organizations. And that might mean that they say, 
I don't fit in this organization yeah, yeah. because my values, I, I just can't do this. Yeah. Or I see a different way of doing things, I'm going to try to work with these people. Yeah. Or I need to stand up on a particular issue and speak out and try to make changes. And all of those things are demanding, but I think they're worthwhile. I think it's a, it's a better way to, to live and to, to work to try to uh, shape and improve the organizations that we have rather mm -hmm. than just saying, uh, I'll just take what there is and uh, not really try to be making an effort to, to make better organizations and better workplaces. Earlier you talked about doing your MBA in business ethics and saying it was, it was tough, there wasn't really, mm -hmm. that wasn't a focus, it wasn't there. Um, fast forwarding to today, how, how has the field grown? And, and, and looking on the applied side, when you look at industry, has, has the corporate world changed? Are you still seeing the same kind of cultures you saw when you were working in the restaurant business in New York? Um, you know, have we been making progress? What are you, what are you seeing? Uh, I, 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 I have a lot of thoughts about that. I'll, I'll try to keep them <laughs> concise. Um, uh, what I see is that, yes, many more people are aware of business ethics. The language of social responsibility and the corporate awareness, student awareness, almost everybody who comes into my class is aware of social responsibility, corporate mm -hmm. social responsibility, the idea of it. Um, so that's changed. That's better, I think. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm disappointed in and not so happy about is that in many ways it's just a change of vocabulary. Right. Yeah. And I'm anxious that because everybody's learned the vocabulary, the concept has become hijacked right. for the sake of corporate branding. Yeah. And I think that my students come in, not everybody, knowing and understanding what corporate social responsibility, or CSR, as it's often referred to, is about. But if they do, they're pretty cynical about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And mostly, they see it as corporate speak. Right. Just sort of putting, and, and not really changing the culture, which mm -hmm. is really all about making the most money possible for the sake of this small group of owners, whoever mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. and continuing to contribute to uh, income inequality or injustices around the world or practices that uh, maybe are harmful to the people who are in the lower classes or laboring, where I think that the, the term and the concept has become more widespread, I'm not entirely convinced that it has dramatically changed uh, corporate practices. I, I mean, I can think of many books and many stories and many teachings and many cases of companies that have said, this is how we're going to do better. And I fully understand that change is a difficult process and that sometimes there are people in the organization that, at the top or at the bottom or in the middle who want to make change. So I, in no way, um, saying corporations are corrupt and mm -hmm. incapable of, you know, of, of adopting this or doing it well, because I think there are a number of great uh, and excellent companies out there. It's an interesting challenge as the professor. I feel um, anxious and skeptical about social responsibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being used disingenuously yeah, and yeah. hypocritically and to create more sales into brand and I think there's plenty of that out there. There are also many good organizations and, and strong managers and, and owners who genuinely want to use their companies to, mm -hmm. uh, to improve customer experiences and to you know, have, mm -hmm. have a better world that they're working in in their towns and cities. Are there specific kind of teaching practices that you use that, that, that help to cultivate not just the knowledge of business ethics and students, but the capacity to act on those ethics, the capacity to help promote change within the organizations or the institutions that they're, 
that they're going to be working in? Are there specific things that you do that you say, this has been a really effective tool for helping students learn how to take this out of the mm -hmm. textbook and, and live it in the organizations they're going to be in? I don't know that I have really strong um, tools or a lot of confidence about particular ways to move from theory to action mm -hmm. uh, or from classroom learning to bringing it into their life. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it does take a, a certain kind of maturity and learning and sometimes for people that's seeing consequences and looking at the cost. Some people uh, just seem to bring kind of innate values or commitments to uh, kind of doing good in the mm -hmm. world um, and being willing to act on that. Some people are more activist than others and mm -hmm. more willing to, yeah. to take on those risks. Um, I think in, in my classrooms, most often we try to look at uh, teaching cases that have been written about experiences mm -hmm. and I think those are really useful for understanding the kind of from, from the person's perspective the experience mm -hmm. of going through a difficult decision but also I, I encourage students to look at the broader consequences not just to the individual but who who all is going to be affected by that and if it's a case that uh, looks back at some event often for years and years I, I think not so much anymore though it's still kind of a, a corporate history story the story of the Ford Pinto mm -hmm. was taught or the Challenger uh, the explosion mm -hmm. on that and and some of the decisions that went in to each of those kinds of crises that there's been enough news about that you can look back on and say wow it was such a disaster, <laughs> or it was mm -hmm. such a big consequence, or it was mm -hmm. so you can sort of see uh, in cases of whistleblowing or in cases of mm, compensation systems gone awry. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there's an interesting case about Sears uh, it having auto repair shops and setting a quota system for breaks mm -hmm. and so <laughs> everybody who came into the shop to get their muffler changed or their engine did, oh they need new brakes well it, you know why is that it turns out because they're getting an incentive mm -hmm. and and so often compensation systems you you think they're just innocuous mm -hmm. kinds of processes yeah. but if you set them right they can really drive unethical sales yeah. And uh, you see that on all those bank cards that's yeah. in the banks that have been uh, criticized and, and mm -hmm. so much in the news about how having uh, compensation tied to certain mm -hmm. kinds of promotions really means that everybody does great at this. Mm -hmm. they, they respond to the incentives, they go right. wild. Yeah. And then uh, con consumers get misled and yeah. the bad end. So often looking back on those kinds of cases helps students see how, how badly awry those can mm -hmm. go. So if you mm -hmm. see the consequences from a little bit of a historical perspective, mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, easier to say, okay, so the right thing to do would have been, you know, right. and, and get a little bit of, yeah. of knowledge that way. But I, I think that still it's, it is a challenge for students to say, okay, well, that was great in the classroom discussion, but right. Uh, look who's looking over my shoulder and I have all this peer pressure yeah, and yeah. you know it's difficult in the workplace so yeah, yeah. it's uh, yeah it's going to be an individual decision. It's interesting in, in my own research I'd look at ethics of writing assessment and, and what you what you're talking about really resonated with with that work where I often argue when you look at the effects of large-scale assessment programs on education systems it's the flaws in the assessment or the flaws mm. in the accountability mechanism mm. that drive negative consequences for kids in that. And, mm -hmm. and I keep pushing in my work to say, you have to look at the consequences. You know? And there's a whole stream within the field of measurement that mm -hmm. really doesn't want to have to look at, mm. they don't want to look at consequences. Mm. Because when you look at consequences and when you look at consequences within the context of individual lives, 
and suddenly you can't ignore the flaws or, or it's very difficult to mm -hmm. ignore the flaws and that mm -hmm. the flaws aren't just you and I have a different theoretical position on what literacy is, for example, right? But no, you've missed an important part of it. And now we're measuring that and now the education's focusing on that and kids are missing important things mm -hmm. that have long-term consequences. And it strikes mm -hmm. me, I often thought with the collapse of Wall Street in the you know decade or so ago, that so much of the collapse was driven by flaws in how bankers were being rewarded yeah. and compensated yeah. and it just skews the ethics of, sure. um, of, of how people behave you know when yeah. the composition you know, the compensations are, are, are skewed um, yeah we're I think really driven to you know you, you put a reward system in front of us and we respond to it and yeah. and many people respond to it without thinking very much because yeah. there is uh, unfortunately still this mentality of this is my job, I'm supposed to do my job, follow yeah. the rules, and that means respond to what I've you know, been laid out to do yeah. without really stopping to think about, <laughs> is this behavior that we want to be supporting and driving yeah. and promoting? Uh, but on the consequences ends of things, I think that, and you know, consequences and utilitarian reasoning, consequential theories are a big branch of ethics. Mm -hmm. and. One of the challenges is that it's hard, if you're struggling with making a decision, it's hard to know in advance what the consequences are gonna be. And I think what you're talking about is just look at the consequences after the fact. It's yeah. not so hard, look at the outcomes. Yeah, yeah. How, how are we affecting these students? Yeah. Um, and I think those are, are good for also assessing decisions going forward. Yeah. But sometimes um, in, ethical decision making, which is often about, should I be deceptive or mm -hmm. should I uh, fully disclose some information or you know, something along those lines. Consequentialist reasoning or you, what's called utilitarian mm -hmm. reasoning, um, which is sometimes kind of summarized as the greatest good for the greatest number of people yeah. or uh, the, you know, the highest maximum uh, consequences mm -hmm. and that also is a the can be the ends justifies the means right, yeah. so all of those pieces aspects of consequential reasoning um, can be quite flawed because mm -hmm. you often don't know what the consequences are going to be mm -hmm. you might get it wrong if you're mm -hmm. if you're trying to forecast that and mm -hmm. if you get it wrong and that's all your moral decision is weighted on that, then you've got it really wrong, you know. Well, I didn't think so and so was going to find out is one of those consequences, <laughs> or I didn't think the whole world was going to see this photo, or what, you know, mm -hmm, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a really big consequence mm -hmm. that you forgot, and mm -hmm. and by then it goes back to, yeah, well, where were your principles? So you need to have those principles as yeah. well, yeah. driving in addition to just thinking, I bet, I bet right. this is going to be the consequences. But one of the consequences that I try to emphasize to students, and I think we often don't talk about very much is what I learned from the experience right. of getting away with something. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes even if you achieve your goal uh, by being a little bit deceptive or cutting mm -hmm. corners or um, not doing the most ethical thing, mm -hmm. um, one of those consequences is what you learn from that. Right. In my life, I found that to be really big. Yeah really big yeah. and sometimes it drives me to keep doing something that I shouldn't be doing yeah. because I learned that I was good at it or I succeeded and wow what a disastrous lesson yeah. so um, where I think it's really important to look at consequences we also have to a get the consequences right but look really broadly at the consequences yeah. and not just did I did I make that sale? Did I get promoted? Right. Did I, you know, but, oh, I learned that I can lie and get away with it and yeah. benefit from it. Wow, <laughs> that's a really powerful lesson. It's a terrible lesson, but, you know, yeah. that's, some people do that. They yeah. can do that all their life because, yeah. and then they start being convinced they're really great yeah, at yeah. getting away with things. Yeah. Well, that's pretty crummy, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then, the other piece of that is they don't know how to be honest to themselves anymore. They think they're deceiving other people, but it turns out they're deceiving themselves. So, uh, so that's a huge consequence. Am I telling the truth? I don't know anymore yeah. because I've lost touch with what that is. Yeah. I've gotten so good at 
Anyway, yeah. that can be, you know, sort of a long road that, that yeah. people or businesses go down. And I think sometimes the successes that come, those consequences get weighed more heavily than what kind of people are we turning out here. Right. Yeah, yeah, so consequences tied to sort of principles and standards mm -hmm. or, 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 yeah. Yeah, sure. it's all, yeah, all those tools, they're all yeah. valuable. Yeah. yeah, don't just use one. Yeah. I'm just curious, um, you built your career around, your research career around business ethics, your teaching career. Mm -hmm. Before you met Julia Child and, mm -hmm. and that, was, was ethics, was this, was, this, was this something that motivated you as a, as a younger person? Is it something that you came to through experience? Where, where did this, where, where did your, your focus and your commitment to this issue, where, where do you see it start? I was raised in a pretty religious family yeah. and I, and it was a narrow branch of Christianity. Yeah. Um, I was very committed to it uh, through my teens and my 20s. And so, you know, I got through the 60s being very upright and got through high school and college without drinking or doing drugs. Yeah. Or, um, and then by my mid-20s, there was a point at which that religion stopped making sense to me for a variety of reasons. Uh, I began to ask questions about whether the church was right or wrong about some things. And while I was in the church, I was very close to my family, other people that were in the church. I really wanted to devote my life to working with the church. And when I uh, felt the need to leave the church in my mid-20s, it was very, it was difficult. I knew it was like going through a door mm -hmm. and I might mm -hmm. not be able to maintain some of those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was a big challenge, but I also felt like I believed in a God that wasn't gonna punish me for learning more, for asking mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it was actually sort of my, my confidence that, that I wasn't gonna, it wasn't just that I wasn't gonna get struck down, but that it, mm -hmm. wasn't, it wasn't a bad thing to be asking questions and mm -hmm. trying to learn. Um, so there was enough of sort of intellectual integrity and consistency. But when I left the church in my mid-20s, was pretty strong, well, it was directly overlapping with my time right. in the restaurant business uh, in New York yeah, City. Yeah. And so I felt like, holding on to those questions about ethics. Yeah. And in fact, I, I, I dated a, a two or three ministers sort of yeah. sequentially because I really <laughs> love talking about theology yeah. and sort of being able to talk about these ethical questions outside of my former church yeah. setting. Um, I, I think that was the piece of my sort of very strong mm. values and religion upbringing that right. I held on to, so it, it yeah. feels yeah. strongly connected to, yeah. to that. It, it actually became a little bit of a challenge to, you know, to, to justify to my parents. It was one mm -hmm. of those struggles to my mother. You know, I, I'm, I'm still practicing, respect me. Yeah. I'm not in the church anymore, but I'm still really committed yeah. to these ethical right. values yeah. and, and yeah. getting her to believe that even though I wasn't right. in the church was yeah. a little bit challenging. Did you learn from that about sort of ways to, from that, that point in your life or that period in life about how either how to teach ethics or how not to teach ethics? Well, I think it left me, um, you know, when you get out of a pretty narrow structure and you, you, you leave that narrow structure because you want to ask more questions, mm -hmm. um, it certainly left me with a, an eagerness to, to keep the doors open mm -hmm. for other students. And so, of course, mm -hmm. I have students who are members of churches mm -hmm. that they're, you know, strictly committed to, uh, and others that have left cultures that I have no familiarity with, and mm -hmm. they bring right. their very different religions or cultural practices. And so, um, as you know, your question when we started about mm -hmm. control, I think mm -hmm. that my approach to ethics is right. is one where I'm really trying to understand where other people are. Yeah and open the doors for them to be able to ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really not my interest to be 
confronting people about mm -hmm. their own personal beliefs, yeah, but yeah. I want people to feel uh, like they can ask mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. and not just answer them with a dogmatic, this is what right. my church told me yeah. to do, or this is what my parents told me to do, but what do I believe? I'm eager, of course, to support students in, in that way, whatever kind of questioning they're doing. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to pull people away from their churches. I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. eager for them to really think carefully about what their own beliefs are and how they support those and, and whether those are consistent with other things that they want to be engaging in, in terms of the work organizations. Yeah, that's fast. I mean, it makes me think of my own. You know, my father was a pastor mm. and, that, and, and but there was always an invitation, you know, that intellectual curiosity was an important part of, of, mm -hmm. of, of our own growth in terms of ethics and mm -hmm. to ask those questions. And I think, but you see often there's a tension between sort of inculcating a specific set of values and this is how we think and this is what we believe and this is how, and, yeah. and yet, you know, um, taking, taking these positions on for yourself and that. And, and there's one way of, one way defeats the other, I think, sometimes, right? I think you talk about this openness and this mm -hmm. exploration and that, and, and uh, it seems to be a, a more productive way of developing ethical reasoning or than simply being told. If you came in mm -hmm. and said, here's my list of, these are the things you shall, this is how you must operate sure. a corporation, yeah. you're not getting very far, are you? Yeah. 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 Yeah, then you might buy my list or you might not. Yeah. And you might, you know, yeah. so, so I have a little bit of a 50-50 chance, you know, do you, do you believe me or not? Or, yeah. and, and that's, you know, I'm just not that interested in, yeah. in promoting my way yeah. of, of, of going about life in the world. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm much more interested in enabling students to find their, what their own values are and how, mm -hmm. how consistent those are with their background or their family is something that they may have to struggle with a little mm -hmm. bit. But, um, you know, I mean, I think, sure, sometimes I'm, I'm interested in, uh, as any good intellectual or academic would be, of sort of throwing in a question from left field. Well, then, how do you yeah, yeah. resolve this? Or how do you respond yeah. to, you know, do you think those people are completely not justified yeah. in whatever they're practicing? You know, I want yeah. people to look broadly, certainly, and I'm willing to, to challenge, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to browbeat somebody so, yeah, they, yeah. so they come around to my perspective, I hope. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think the, in the world of business ethics, there are many people who have um, kind of a passion or a sense of mission. So yeah. there, there are people that come from uh, theology or divinity backgrounds yeah. as well as philosophy and yeah. some management. So within this world, this field of business ethics, academics who I see at conferences and I, yeah. and I have over the last 30 or more years, um, there are some people who are, who are really convinced that they have you know, the right mm -hmm. set of right, answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit like, here yeah. are my 10 rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they write from that perspective yeah. and they're always sort of saying, oh yes, and Aristotle, or oh yes, and you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. trying to get people to their sort of one right way of doing things. Yeah. Um, but for me, you know, and I understand that because they come into the field, as I think right. with pastors and people yeah. in the ministry, there's such a, a love, mm -hmm. often a love for God or a love for Jesus or mm -hmm. a particular prophet or a teaching or book um, or church, the sense mm -hmm. of community. And so I get it that their love and their sense of, of strength from that is something that they want to promote. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, I think as, uh, as with anyone who has a strong set of beliefs, mm -hmm. that, that love needs to, to get expanded out to mm -hmm. include the acknowledgement of other, mm -hmm. other people's values mm -hmm. and, and perspectives. And, and, and love for supporting those people doesn't necessarily mean sucking them into your flock in particular right. or your followers. You know, they, they, it's to me, and you know, of course, this is, is sort of parenting and teaching all, all mixed together as well as probably feeding, but you know, the idea is to nurture them yeah. to be who they're going to be and, and, and help them discover themselves. Yeah. Have you struggled with sort of the ethics of teaching ethics? And, and what are some of the struggles or the issues that you've faced as you've kind of worked through that? 
The ethics of teaching ethics. I, I've certainly struggled with some of the ethics of teaching in general, mm -hmm. uh, and and this year as well as other years. You know, there are students that that plagiarize, or students that cheat, and ugh, mm -hmm. ugh, it's just really it's painful. It's hard, especially mm -hmm. when you're taking this approach of I love my students and I love teaching and I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how I can nurture you yeah. and then somebody cheats or turns in a plagiarized paper it just feels mm -hmm. like ugh, ugh, such betrayal so you know how do you confront that how do you turn it into a learning experience do you just say boom that's it you're out or do mm -hmm. you say look here's what you did please do it better or you know try to work with them and, mm -hmm. and again my response thinking of a uh, an episode this past year, uh, several students turned in papers that were plagiarized and, and my approach was to talk about it in class and mm -hmm. to, to in, um, give them a small window of time in which they could do it better. And, and I n knew those students well enough to know that people brought very different backgrounds to it and very different uh, educational experiences that that mm -hmm. might have sort of prepared them to yeah. do that. So some of them, I you know, had some pretty intensive conversations mm -hmm. about this is what our expectations are. Mm -hmm. Even though I thought, here we are, it's a fourth year class. Surely right. they've had many discussions about this. But mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, want to help students learn from that. But I also don't want to be a pushover. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, I want to have very firm standards mm -hmm. about what's expected, not just sort of say, oh, Robin's a nice person, so right. I'm sure it'll all be fine. Yeah. Um, so there are, yeah. you know, there are times when I've had to flunk people in classes or mm -hmm. on assignments uh, because turns out I do have strong ethical standards about yeah, yeah, yeah. what's, you know, what, what good scholarship is. Yeah, I mean, plagiarism is an interesting one because there are very much cultural values around mm -hmm. how we share ideas, how we appropriate ideas, and and that, and it's not nearly as uh, often cut and dry as sometimes people would like it to be. Yeah, so yeah. then part of our practice as educators, I think, is to put the rules out there yeah. and, and teach what our expectations is, and to be yeah. very clear about um, how to do it right. And if, yeah. if we have a student body in which students are coming from many different educational backgrounds, mm -hmm. which happens obviously even within Alberta high schools yeah. or, or, or schools leading to our universities, not, not all students coming from other countries, and even family backgrounds and mm -hmm. expectations. Mm -hmm. And I often think of a, um, a Pete Seeger quote who says plagiarism is basic to all culture because yeah. musicians, folk musicians, of course, they want to take from each other, yeah. build on each other. And I love that. But in academic scholarship, here's how you have to do right. these quotes. Yeah, yeah. And here's how you cannot write a paper yeah. with just taking other people's words yeah, and pretending yeah. they're your own. Uh, so then that's an important thing to learn. So we need to teach that. And we need to make sure that students really understand it. And then we need to follow up on it. When students say to me, oh gosh, I've always written papers this way, or this is, you know, nobody's ever called me on this before. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, crumb, my faculty colleagues need to be doing a better yeah. job of, of really sort of monitoring yeah. the papers that they, sure. that they get in. Yeah. Well, I think that takes us to the end here. So thank you for okay. sharing your, your insights, your experiences, and, uh, and your stories yeah, with fun. us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fun to talk. Was like, yeah, it's great.